Okay, so in this video, we're talking about carbohydrates. So when we look at carbohydrates exactly, we want to talk about how exactly do they come about and what constitutes them in nature. So I just want us to outline certain things. For instance, uh, their chemical structure. So when we look at carbohydrates, already from the name you can tell that they have carbon in them. So let's start by first identifying the fact that these are carbon-containing um, compounds. So the general formula for carbohydrates is, is C, then N, then we have H2O, then another N. In some books you may actually find that it's something like this. Okay, so when you find this uh, in certain books, it uh, this it's the same thing. This is to tell you if you want to find the um, the carbohydrates that have six carbons, you just place uh, n represents the number of carbons. So this would be C six H two the power uh, subscript six. This will give you C six H twelve. O6, which is the same thing you would get if you are using this formula. It will still be C6, H12, O6. Okay, so having said that, I want you to realize that the ratio of water and carbohydrates does not change. So when you look at this uh, ratio, you discover that uh, N is the only variable number. So even when you try to find the empirical formula of this carbohydrate, you'll find that it will still give you H2O as the final thing. Okay? So this is uh, how we can find what type of carbohydrate that we're talking about. Okay? So this is what we mean when we say the proportions of Hydrogens and oxygen are the same in water, right? Having said that, I want us to realize that we have what we call a functional group. Okay. So while we have a functional group, when you find this anywhere, they mean this functional group is what enables that molecule to participate in a chemical reaction. Okay? It gives it its chemical properties okay so for instance if we have a functional group of oh already you know that this is going to be an alcohol so when we talk about carbohydrates their functional groups are either aldehydes we have what we call aldehydes or ketones okay so these are what uh, determine whether a carbohydrate is going to be a reducing sugar or a non-reducing sugar. Okay. So, when you look at an aldehyde, let me just erase. Just a minute. So, we're going to look at an aldehyde. How exactly does it come about? Okay. All right. So, when you look at an aldehyde in general, an aldehyde has a carbonyl group. So this is when you look at something like this, a carbonyl group. This is what we mean. It's carbon double bonded to an oxygen atom. So when you look at this, if this is your carbohydrate, okay, we have H there. Okay. So for instance, we have H O H. Okay, CH two, CH O H. So when you look at this, you discover that when you find that this carbonyl group, right, that you find here, when it's on carbon number one. So this is carbon number one. This is carbon number two. Carbon number three number four and number five. So when you find that the carbonyl group is on carbon number one, we call this an aldehyde. Okay. 
okay this is an aldehyde group but when you find that the carbonyl group is on carbon number two we call it a ketone so this is a ketone group and these are the functional groups of all carbohydrates okay having said that we we'll also look at the different types of classes that we find in carbohydrates this is to tell you that we have monosaccharides disaccharides so we have monosaccharides we have dye we also have polysaccharides and even oligosaccharides okay okay so when you look at monosaccharides these are single sugar units okay so monosaccharides are actually the basic building blocks of all polysaccharides or all carbohydrates okay so for instance if if we talk about a building block a building block we mean this is what actually forms these carbohydrates so mono means one di means two poly this is 10 to infinity okay approximately oligosaccharides 3 to 10 so these numbers that you're able to see this is to tell you that the number of carbon atoms in here when we have two uh, monosaccharides we call it a disaccharide okay so if you have one glucose molecule here and another glucose molecule and then these two are bonded uh, chemically through a glycosidic bond okay we call this a disaccharide all right so we're going to look at these disaccharides monosaccharides even oligosaccharides individually okay this was just a brief explanation on how these come about so now we're going to look at what we call the monosaccharides Okay, monosaccharides. So when you look at these monosaccharides, they're the simplest of all sugars. So these are the simplest of all sugars. Okay, in layman's language, or you can say of all carbohydrates, these are the simplest. Okay, so when you look at uh, these monosaccharides, you have... Uh, I can call them characteristics. One, they are sweet, crystalline in nature. So these are also crystalline in nature. And they are soluble in water. Okay, soluble in water. Okay, so these are the monosaccharides that we have. So they can actually be classified according to the number of carbon atoms that they possess, okay? So that's how we can classify these. This is how you can know if this is a monosaccharide or disaccharide, okay? Okay, when you look at the monosaccharides, they are used as a direct source of energy. So because they're very simple, they can be used as a direct source of energy right so meaning when your body needs to use up uh, glucose or rather this monosaccharide to get energy it can easily get it because this molecule is very simple okay so these monosaccharides are identified according to the number of carbon atoms they have for instance when we look at a trios trioses this from the word itself trio meaning they have three carbons in them when we look at a tetros these have four carbons when we look at the pentos these have five carbon atoms in them so this is what we mean and the number goes on we have hexoses which have six heptoses which have uh, seven and so on and so forth so Having said that, we discover that these monosaccharides can actually exist in different forms, okay? So when we mean different forms, we mean they can either be found in a stretch chain or a ring.
So monosaccharides can be found in a straight chain. Okay. Or a ring structure. Okay. So what they mean by straight chain is what we call a Fisher projection. If you have seen this anywhere. I'm sure by now you must be familiar with this. So when you see something like this. This is a straight chain. Okay. It's not forming any ring. This is what we call a Fisher projection or just basically a straight chain. Okay. So this is what we are meaning. This is a straight chain. And then when you look at the ring, you find something like this. Okay. For instance, we have an OH there. Okay, so we have H O H. So when you look at this, this is the ring structure, right? This is the straight chain. This is what they mean. So they say these carbohydrates can exist in either one of these that we're able to see here, right? Okay. So we're going to see how these rings come up now. All right, so the open chain can exist in different isomers, okay? So when you talk about isomers, when you talk about what we call isomers, so you notice that in this section we have more of chemistry as well. So these isomers have the same uh, molecular formula, okay? All right. So these are, they have the same molecular formula. So isomers have same molecular formula, but different arrangement of atoms in the structure, okay? So there's a way in which uh, these are going to be isomers of each other, right? You find that they'll have the same molecular formula in the open chain. And we're going to see that, okay? So when you look at the open chain, there's a way in which they configure themselves such that they'll have the same molecular formula, but they'll differ in their structures, okay? So the common types, and you need to take note of this, the common types of uh, isomers that we find, we have the L and the D isomers. So we have L and D isomers, okay? So when it is L, it means the, the OH is found on the left. When it is D, it's, it means the OH is found on the right. Okay, now you may be wondering which OH are they talking about? So let me just draw a structure here, just to show what is happening. Okay. Okay, so when you look at this H and the OH, this is the OH that we're referring to. So when you find that the OH on carbon number four, if this is a ribose, meaning it's what a five, uh, it's a five vapor uh, carbon molecule, you discover that the OH is found on the right. So this is going to be called D ribose. Okay. So if there's D ribose, it means the other one is going to be L ribose. Okay. So this LRI was is coming about because the OH can switch. Okay. All right. So you find instead of it being on the right, this time it's going to be on the left. Meaning it seems to be D ribose now. It's going to be L ribose. This will be L ribose. So this is what they mean when they say these are isomers of each other now the isomer that is most common in nature when we talk about the carbohydrates is actually the d isomer okay okay 
Okay, so this is the D isomer. So you may be wondering what the D is studying for dextro. L is studying for laboratory. Okay, I don't know the spellings, but when you look at this, we have what we call optical activity. Op optical activity. So this is to tell you that when these two carbohydrates have been exposed to polarized light, so we have what we call as polarized light, you find that the carbohydrate is going to uh, arrange itself in such a way that the OH will either be on the left or the right. Okay? So this is what we mean. Alright, but don't worry, all this will be discussed furthermore as you uh, take chemistry. So I'm going to talk about uh, triosis now, okay? Earlier mentioned, we said triosis have three carbon atoms in them. So we're going to look at uh, one of the most common triosis. Actually, we have three types. So this should actually make it very easy to, very easy to remember. So we have, okay. So this uh, this is glyceraldehyde. All right. So this is glyceraldehyde, which has the aldehyde is coming about because of this carbonyl group on the bar one. But we're able to see. So when you look at this uh, glyceraldehyde, you notice that uh, the carbon is on number one, and uh, we have three carbons in, in it. This is what makes it a trios. Okay, so we have what we call L-glyceraldehyde and D-glyceraldehyde. We also have D-hydroxyacetone, d hydro hydroxyacetone okay so the three types that we have are l and d glyceraldehyde and dehydroxyacetone these are the types of triosis that we have and they can easily be broken down to give us energy uh, during uh, tissue respiration and during glycolysis which will be further lent you find that glucose is broken down into this glyceraldehyde and the dehydroxyacetone. And in the process, lactic acid is released and pyruvate acid are produced from the metabolism of these uh, triosis. 